Hello, my name is Michelle Fillion. Uh, I'm a surgical oncologist in Wilmington, North Carolina. And I have the honor of talking today a little bit more about ERAS protocols and what else can we do beyond colorectal surgery? First, I'd like to say I have no disclosures. So beyond ERAS for colorectal surgery, can we do more? Short answer is yes, of course we can. And the question is how and how can we make this happen? So first I'm gonna go over a little bit of the recap of ERAS pathways and its expansion over multiple service lines. Then we'll touch base on kind of best practices in order to coordinate the delivery of these ERAS protocols. And then finally understanding what we need to do better. So ERAS for colorectal surgery, when it first started had some major guiding principles. This was, the main one is to decrease perioperative stress, pain, and GI function, all while trying to maintain normal physiologic function and also to improve an accelerated recovery after surgery to get patients back to their normal baseline. The aims of this, of course, decrease post-operative complications, improve recovery, as well as reduce the length of stay. This is just going back to the original 22 bundled interventions that were used in a multimodality and a multidisciplinary approach to improve the perioperative care of colorectal surgery patients. Particularly, there's the preoperative phase, the intraoperative phase, and the postoperative phase. And one of the one of the interventions I do want to circle back with at the end of this talk is really going to be focusing on the audits, audit and compliance of the outcomes of using the ERAS pathways. Over the past decade or so, there's been a continued expansion of ERAS protocols to multiple other surgical lines. Physicians and surgeons have really noted that, wow, our, our patients really are doing better, decreased complications, decreased length of stay, overall increased patient satisfaction, and the patients are doing better with these ERAS protocols. So of course, it's been expanded to different surgical lines and more surgical subspecialties wanted to get involved in the ERAS pathways. So as this was going on, different uh, protocols were developed by other surgeons at different institutions. And as more data was published and collected, the ERAS Society continued to collect this information and per, uh, per, perform and gather consensus guidelines based on ev evidence-based medicine for these specific surgical procedures. Protocols can then be individualized and adapted to all these special surgically uh, procedures. However, they still have the main principles in, in place. Just for example, right here is this list of all the current uh, ERAS Society specific guidelines. And most recently, they've even started with neonatology intestinal surgery. But you can see back in 2009, this is when specifically it came out for colorectal surgery. And even years before that, it was named as a fast track surgery uh, for colorectal surgery. But you can see it's involved everything from uh, pelvic surgery, urology, gynecology, HPB, orthopedic breast recon, and there's even going to be some vascular surgery coming down the line. Specifically, I just took a sample and was looking at the pancreatic ERAS guidelines. This one has 27 specific recommendations. There gives some additional guidance in terms of when to use preoperative biliary drainage, the use of nasogastric tubes, which is going to be none to selective, the use of intraoperative uh, perianastomotic drains, which is going to be in place you need to be using those for your uh, local procedures, but also performing the anti-colic duodenoj genostomy to improve gastric emptying. This is also coupling with a multimodality pain control where you can use epidural, and at least at our institution, instead of epidural analgesiac, we use a spinal analgesiacs with a one-time dose of Duramorph. Also, the, I use the uh, transverse abdominis plane, the tap blocks, as well as multimodality pain with NSAIDs, acetaminophen, and muscle relaxants. There's also additional recommendations on early nutrition, uh, glycemic control, as well as avoiding a routine use of somatostatin analogs. I wanted to show you a picture of what we've done at New Hanover Regional Medical Center. This is when our institution first rolled out our colorectal ERAS pathway back in 2016. And fast forward over these past four to five years is that we are now at 15 different service lines. We've showed kind of where we are up to about 2020. So big things and messages that we want to take home now is how to manage the implementation of these ERAS protocols when you're starting to do them on a broad implementation. Well, you need buy-in from the hospital and or your healthcare system that you're involved in. There has to be a centralized process. There needs to be dedicated ERAS coordinators, nursing, and staff. 
one of the things that we found is very important is to do a protocolized approach into the patient optimization. So not only is it just the surgeon and the patient, you have a whole other cadre and support system to help the patients get through the system of undergoing ERAF pathways. All of this is to set yourself up to succeed. You succeed, patients succeed, and overall the hospital system gets better outcomes. So specifically, we'll send protocolized referrals to endocrinology for uncontrolled diabetes, referrals to cardiology for angina, as well as blood management clinic for those that we are noted anemic so that they can be treated with IV uh, iron leading up to surgeon. In addition, we've expanded our preoperative -oper, pre optimization protocols to be uh, including nutritionists uh, for uh, immunonutrition outside just the complex carbohydrate drink, also doing fragility and cognitive function assessments. We have dedicated hospitalists that are involved with the risk assessment for these broad multi-specialty multi uh, surgical patients, and anesthesiologists are involved with the anesthetic risk assessment as well. Just to kind of walk you through a little bit of what it takes to be uh, centralized in the delivery of ERAF pathways. So here I have a schematic that's listed. Um, surgery is scheduled by the surgeon's office. Uh, we use an electronic health record. So as soon as the case is uh, posted in our EPIC work queue, it drops down in the surgical navigation set of our work, work queue. They're real time working on this queue as it comes. So if you drop it in, they'll either get to it that day or within 24 hours, um, the case will be pulled. There'll be a surgical navigation center, a specially trained nurse that is going to pull the patient's information, the procedure that's to be performed, the type of anesthetic, as well as then pulling questionnaires and calls the patient and goes through all these questionnaires with the patient. This will then triage out to low risk procedures, those that can be done with a phone assessment um, up front. Then it's looking at mostly outpatient, inpatient surgery, and then risk stratifying those based on their medical complexity and that which patients need to be coming in to the surgical navigation center for a pre-admission testing visit and who needs to be seeing a nurse versus who needs to be seeing a hospitalist and an anesthesiologist. So looking at one of the questionnaires that uh, we're oft, often used, just to give you an idea, is the stop bang questionnaire. This is really one that is targeting looking at those with sleep apnea or undiagnosed sleep apnea, those that are snoring or tired or have the apnea, as well as those with big BMI, thick neck, older age, and, and male. Another thing that our institution has started to do is to also come up with a medical complexity questionnaire. And I won't go through this line by line, but if you wanna take a moment and just look through, that there are many points here that they've been weighted um, based on the different questions. So what they'll do is they'll add up all the, the point scale based on the patient specific, specific uh, mor morbidities and we'll come up with a number. If that number is greater than five, they're considered to be a high complexity patient. So this is an example of looking at our ERAS protocol in the surgical home patients. Uh, to the left of the screen really walks through all the different live protocols we have right now for ERAS uh, patients that are falling into these categories. On the right side of the screen that you can see the medical complexity and those that are requiring preoperative consultation with a, a nurse uh, practitioner or if they're going to be requiring a hospitalist and anesthesiologist for ultimate uh, optimization leading up to surgery. This is just an example of like what kind of work frame and timeline that we have to go through. So what you can see is I kind of pulled one of our data of looking at uh, all the specialties and the average optimization window. And that window is actually the time that the surgery is booked uh, versus the time the surgery is being performed. And so while orthopedics has the longest window, all the other surgical specialties are really working within about a two, less than a two week window that you have to optimize your patients as much as possible. And this is just an example of uh, looking at 2019 data where we screened almost about 6,000 pa patients looking at the frailty and looking at the cognitive risk function as well and looking at the demographic of the surgical patients that we have. The next thing I want to touch base on is, is not only that we're rapidly expanding ERAS through multiple surgical specialties, is that with this broad expansion becomes the, the importance of adequate reporting as well as completing um, 
um, auditing of how well you're doing in compliance to the program. That's a whole nother aspect of this that needs to come into play. Because while it was smaller um, specialty, there was uh, fewer people involved in the system, so there could be more control. And as it gets bigger and larger, we need to make sure that we're doing the right things consistently for our patient population. This is, um, this is a study by Dr. Aliyah out of uh, MD Anderson, and it's looking at incomplete reporting of ERAS elements. What they went through is they looked at original manuscripts comparing outcome of ERAS versus standard pathway or traditional pathway of surgical patients undergoing colectomy and uh, proctectomy. And any study had to include over 50 patients. They looked at both PET, uh, PubMed, Embase, and Cochrane. There was over 1,200 um, different potential studies. All said and done, they got all down to 50 papers that they reviewed. The thing that they found is there's significant variation in the description of the protocols that were listed in these manuscripts. The median number of elements that were reported were only nine. Most frequent elements were looking at the post-op diet advancement as well as early mobilization. Compliance was only reported in 24 studies. So less than 50% of all these studies are reporting, reporting their compliance data. Morbidity and length of stay were the most commonly reported outcomes. So MBC Anderson came up with a uh, some rec recommendation. These are on tabular reporting of all elements in the exam uh, examined ERAF pathways, as well as the corresponding elements in the traditional pathways, making sure you're explaining all ERAS elements very clearly in your specific algorithm so they can be reproduced, report compliance for all the elements as part of the ERAS protocols, and if there's failure of one of these ERAS elements, that it should be reported and explained why. The length of stay is often used as an outcome measure um, and the discharge criteria should be included. And also it should be noted whether it's when their discharge is ready or if their discharge is actually foot out the door. When morbidity is used as an outcome, efforts should be made to grade the complications and stratify them according to the severity uh, on their standards uh, injury uh, score. Also, another thing I want to bring up again is this compliance issue. And uh, University of Alberta had gone back through and looked at their ERAS protocol, specifically just in the colorectal surgery patients, and found that they were only at 40% looking at all the different elements. They did start to incorporate the ERAS interactive audit system to track and measure compliance. They were able to get their overall compliance up to 60, which I still say is not high enough, but their pre op com compliance was up to 83%. So taking all of this together is that yes, with the ERAS systems, we can do a lot more outside of colorectal surgery. Rapid expansion into multiple different surgical specialties, we can keep doing that. But we have to also keep in mind that this requires significant buy-in from hospitals, as well as a multidisciplinary and disciplinary and coordinated care amongst multiple different physicians, staff, and offices, as well as the engagement of the patient. What else we can do better? We can do better with compliance, we can do better with reporting, we can do better with auditing. And I think if we can learn and track our own data and how well we're applying these ERAS pathways, they can continue to be modified and tailored overall to improve the care of the surgical patient. All right, thank you very much um, for this opportunity to do a virtual uh, SAGES talk. Thank you.